Acknowledgements. This is at the beginning of the book. A work of this type is brought to completion only with the assistance of many persons. It is difficult to know just who should be gratefully acknowledged for their part in the collecting and editing of the original essays, which were combined to form the body of part two of this volume. Certainly, Professor C.D. Deshmuk, best known for his editing of the discourses, and Adi K. Rani, Mayor Baba's tireless secretary and manager of Mayor Met Publication, the publications, played an extremely important role. In connection with certain other material included in part two, grateful recognition is also given to Mayor Publications, to Circle Publications, and to the Awakener for the use of portions previously printed by them. Part one, which describes the Sabas programs, programs given by Mayor Baba in India during November 1955, makes copious use of material faithfully transcribed at that time by Faram and Kishan Singh, and later collated by Ramju Abdullah. Both Ramju Abdullah and Erich Jiswala have made frequent suggestions and assisted greatly with clarifications in the final text. The sequence of events given in part one is approximately that followed by Baba in the first week. However, the various persons, incidents, and statements made by Baba were woven together from the entire four weeks program. The original on the spot translations of Baba's gestures made by Erich have often been modified in the interest of continuity and greater ease of perusal. There are also certain persons who have performed the invaluable service of offering suggestions from the viewpoint of the public. This especially difficult task has been faithfully performed by Mir Baba's sister, Manija, Manija S. Irani, by Murshida I.B. Odus, and by Ben and Shirley Courtright. Finally, the entire contents of the volume have been approved by Mayor Baba. It cannot be pretended that therefore everything is as Mayor Baba would have described it himself, nor that Mayor Baba necessarily agrees completely with certain expressions of opinion, which have inevitably been the narrators. However, the reader can be assured that the major content of the volume is given directly by Mayor Baba and that the remainder finds some point of, ex of acceptance or at least tolerance by him. D.E. Stevens, Red Bank, New Jersey, February 1957. Introduction. An introduction usually discusses the background of the contents of the volume or of its author. In the present instance, it seems desirable to upset this precedent and discuss the reader instead. This work is directed towards that very large group of people who want answers to their living problems. Perhaps it may seem odd to go to India for such answers. Actually, it is not. The East has, has labored for thousands of years to find the keys to life so that daily living could be patterned in consonance with them. The East has perhaps not yet found perfection, nor its people the perfect way. However, they do provide a background of sincere effort and insight which is almost unique in the world. From that background, one could expect great individuals to emerge who would be especially fitted to teach us how to live. Mayor Bob is clearly one of those invaluable persons. One has only to be in his presence for a short time to sense the mighty forces at work in him. One has only to be for a few days with his close disciples to know that his greatness flows readily into other persons. One has only to be in India for a short time and to look and listen with sympathetic eyes and ears to know that the spiritual greatness of India springs from roots which lie deep in the hearts of its people. 
The rub for the Occidental lies in the method of applying these living insights. This is where the present reader must be discussed. When he thinks of India, he thinks perhaps of a poor people, often illiterate, given to complicated superstitions. When he thinks of India's religious life, he sees ancient temples populated by many gods. Or if she plums a smaller area of knowledge, she recalls odd yogis and mystics given to strange practices. This is the screen of partial or incorrect understanding through which one must draw to draw to through one, sorry. This is the screen of partial or incorrect understanding through which one must pierce to draw on India for insight into Western man's problems. The task seems almost too great for ingrained notions yield only grudgingly. Yet India does have buried in the great mass of extrania a profound knowledge of man's purpose. And this is the West, and this the West needs desperately. An astoundingly small proportion of persons in the Western world know why they are here. And not knowing why they are here, few know how to starch their lives with a sense of vigorous, dependable purpose. Instead, life becomes a matter of energetic effort to solve today's needs. If tomorrow comes to mind, it can only be looked upon as an extension of today's problems. It is no wonder that nervousness and irritability are produced. It is also no wonder that thinking, feeling people are dissatisfied and ask in their hearts what it is all about. But where can they find the answers? Apparently not in a wild negative bout with life. That was tried in the 1920s and the results were so unsatisfactory that the next generation turned its back and began again to look for a positive answer. Apparently the answers can't be found in ritual form or ceremony. This is a matter of the spirit and to tend to the needs of spirit requires men and women of spirit. But there are not too many of these. Where can they be found? And how can their answers be turned into answers for us? This is the great dilemma of a war-weary, soul-weary age. If India has clues which could be of help, how can they be used? Certainly, it is not in harmony with Western traditions to build temples with many armed gods and goddesses, nor is it in the Western tradition to engage in strange practices of breath or posture so that one may do impossible physical feats. Rather than attracting the Occidental, such habits are apt to repel him or her. If the East is to be of any help, it must be able to give Western men and women something which can be welded into their practically practical daily life. It cannot divorce them from their family and turn them into lone whirling dervishes, nor can, I, nor can I give them odd notions, which will not allow them to earn a living in conventional, conventional business. This is the real problem in trying to translate any Eastern answers into Western words. It has often been said that the great world religions are furthest apart in their formal parts and closest together in their true spirit. This seems true and provides a clue by which the West may draw on the heritage of the East. It is the spirit which is needed and form becomes only a meaningless husk to be discarded. It is not necessary for the Occidental to take up breathing exercises, postures, diets, or the murmuring of sacred phrases. It is true that an unbiased analysis of such practices 
usually leads to the conclusion that they do produce astonishing results. However, in large part, they are aside from the matter of spirit, which is the nub of the issue. The first part of this volume describes how the great contemporary spiritual leader, Meribaba, transferred something of this spirit to a picked group of his close followers in India. The Western reader will be struck by the fact that there was almost nothing of ritual, dogma, or strange practices involved. Yet the sessions produced results, often remarkable results. The narrator, for instance, who has perhaps been a rather crusty person over the years, was told by many friends upon his return how much more enjoyable he had, quote, quote unquote, suddenly become. Such comments were made both by persons who knew of the nature of his stay in India, as well as those who did not. Apparently then, there is a way of transferring some shade of spiritual greatness without use of the elaborate form and ritual which would be repugnant to much of Western civilization. Further, there are apparently such resources presently available in the world which can be drawn upon. This is an important fact to each person who searches for a more certain meaning to life. The first contribution to a searching reader can then be the reassurance that such wholesome answers exist. The second contribution given in part two is a description of the nature of life and death, sleep and waking, love and obedience. The third contribution is a very intriguing one, which is first suggested early in the Savas program described in part one. Meribaba makes no bones about referring to himself as the avatar or Christ of his age. Nothing could be more surely calculated to arouse the argumentative instincts of the Occidental. In the first place, many doubt that there ever was such a person as Jesus Christ, or at least that he had anything of the stature attributed to him. Second, the time for such events always seems to be in the past. To have someone jolt the present with such a rude claim seems a deliberate challenge to a sense of modern rationality. A third attitude often encountered is that Jesus Christ was the one and only Son of God and that there will not be another. Finally, there is a deeply ingrained conviction that if Christ should come again, good breeding would cause him to avoid claiming that he was the Christ. For all of these reasons, it is upsetting to find a man of an undoubted stature state with candor that he is the Christ. It is always easier to deal with such claims in the past. To have them occur today presents a challenge of frightening dimensions. There is hardly a person reared in Christendom who has not jeered in his heart at the Pharisees for not having recognized Christ's stature, or at least for not having treated him fairly. By implication, if one condemns a person who may turn out to be the modern Christ, then one becomes a modern counterpart of the biblical Pharisee. On the other hand, if one mistakenly accepts a man to be Christ, then one has committed a major blunder, which may have far reaching consequences in one's personal life. This peculiar dilemma in which the individual is placed explains largely the violent explosivity of the issue. The greater the obvious caliber of the man, the greater the explosivity. And Mayor Baba is certainly no mean man. Section one is liberally sprinkled with Mayor Baba's references to his divine stature. It is suggested that the reader deliberately put this question, quote unquote, on file as he reads part one and allow the personality and part of the man to speak for themselves. Part two will provide much additional material to estimate Mayor Baba's qualities. Part three in turn, is an attempt on the part of the narrator 
to describe his own estimation of this extremely important and naughty subject. The age of jet transfer, tra sorry, the age of jet, jet transport and atomic power does not render the question of Christhood obsolete, but brings it more insistently to the forefront. Mankind will need such a superhuman force in the world to dispense the clarity and balance needed to equate against the superhuman questions it now faces. If God did not provide a means for answering the questions he allows man to raise, it would be an unreasonable world in which he forces us to live. But there is reason to believe that those answers do exist in the great nation, which specializes in the inner springs of man's nature, India. Stripped of the refuge, which the centuries produce, paired of inessentials, which serve only to separate man from man and woman from woman, and reduced to the hard core of spirit, the answer can emerge from the wisdom of that land. The answer would not be a new one, but it would be a vital infusion into the lifeless stalks, which once bore up in man the ripe knowledge of his own pur purpose and dignity. D.E. Stevens, signed D.E. Stevens. Introduction to the Colophon edition. 15 years have passed since the occurrence of the events described in the first part of this volume. During that time, the word of Mayor Baba has raced around the world as he had predicted it would. Tens of thousands of devotees, as well as the interested and the curious, have made pilgrimages, have made pilgrimages to the centers most closely associated with him near Amanagar in India and near Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. Again, all this as is as he had said it would be. Mayor Baba, quote unquote, dropped the body during this time in January 1969 and was entombed in Merbad in the small building erected and decorated at his order years before. At the time of his entombment and again during April to June of 1969, and that is starred. The asterisk says, Mayor Baba had made detailed plans for a great darshan, parentheses, literally a bestowing of spiritual blessing by the master, close parentheses, for the many thousands of new and old devotees to be held in Pune in April to June 1969. His close disciples are Mandali, or Mandali carried out those plans with results that will form part of the great lore of Baba through the centuries. Back to the text. So at the time of his entombment, and again, during April to June of 1969, he gave his darshan at Guru Prasad in Pune and at Marabad and Mirzad to his lovers who flocked to his side from all over the world in obedience to his invitation. Many, perhaps all, had wondered how arrangements for this great darshan, which were made while he was in the flesh, could be carried out with anything more than sorrowful obedience after he had left the body. Perhaps it's its accomplishment was the great event never witnessed before and never to happen again that he had predicted the year before. And if it was not, and that occurrence is yet to happen, the projection of his presence was nevertheless so real and so forceful that he seemed to fill all of the space as well as all of the hearts at Guru Prasad, Marizad, and Maribad. 
They had come expecting sorrow and left filled with a lightness and joy most had never known. But these recitations of the fulfillment of things to come leaves one important blank. Leaves one important blank. What about the breaking of the silence, which Baba commenced in 1925 and he, which he repeatedly linked to his manifestation? He had not audibly done so when his body lay lifeless on January 31st. Was this a great omission? Or had the entire 44 years of his silence been a master stroke of technique to shake people and help them start to focus on the great reality? To the first question, certainly not. To the second, most probably yes. But a being as, sub as sublime as Mirababa appears never to act within the restrictions of one sole aim. It takes little time in his presence to sense that he is everywhere at once and his actions have a concentrated impact on, at many levels and points. When the entire story is in and one looks at the available facts, I feel one must draw the conclusion that Mayor Baba did break his silence and manifested during his lifetime. Others whom I deeply respect feel differently. In any event, there will be hundreds of learned treatises on this subject in the future. It is not my purpose in this brief introduction to present one of the earliest of these analyses, but I do wish to record a few keys to this enigma certain of which depend upon observations in the present. Mayor Baba often said that when he broke his silence, he would say the only meaningful word and that this would shortly be followed by his manifestation. Tradition arising from thousands of years of profound spiritual activity gives us certain keys to help understand the enigma of his words. Many sources describe the origin of creation by saying, first, there was the word, or something similar. How curious that Mayor Baba would say that when he broke his silence, he would say the only meaningful word. Tradition also tells us that it is part of the job description of the messenger of God that he shall renew the word when Dharma has decayed. Baba has said many times that this was his responsibility in his lifetime. Clearly then, a more basic meaning of word and the breaking of the silence to give, um, to give the only real word has to do with the fundamental thrust of creation at all levels. But still another intriguing clue Baba describes the origin of creation as the whim of God stirring him to know his divinity consciously and compares it to a wave surging across the stillness of infinite unconscious God. A wave does not leave absolute calmness in its wake, but a succession of diminishing waves behind it. What is all of creation but a bat? but a vast variety of different species of wave disturbances. What is sound but a wave disturbance? And finally, the key, what is a word but a wave disturbance? The train of association moves on inescapably. What more apt way to describe the origin of God's creation than to say, first there was the word. And if one is the avatar, the messenger of the age, whose role it is to renew and revivify God's word, what more profound way can there be to break a silence than to give renewed impetus to the original sound, which was the origin of all creation? 
an audible word is dwarfed into meaninglessness in relation to a function so fundamental. All this is fascinating theory, but the honest inner workman of the present and the future will ask, what evidence was there in Baba's lifetime for a renewed vitality in creation? A fair question. My specialty is people and what goes on inside them. If I could say anything meaningful in relation to the question, it would have to be based on observation within my specialty. In the 1930s and 40, 1940s, when I first became deeply involved in man's inner being and how it progresses, it seemed to me that internally aware individuals were either rare or not very evident. And that in any case, internal motion was extremely slow at best. In the 1950s, this began to change. There were obviously more people searching and they tended to be more vigorous in their search. By the mid 1960s, there were thousands and their rate of motion was astonishing. It was evident that Mayor Baba's new humanity was literally at hand. From then on, there was no question in my mind that Mayor Baba's true manifestation was already in flood tide. It only remained to trip across a few clues to the quote unquote word and the quote unquote breaking of the silence contained contained in the Bible, and among others, in Guru Nanak's utterances to round out the picture. And Guru Nanak's utterances starred, and the asterisk says, Nanak, the inspiration for the Sikh movement, stated in a variety of ways that as creation arises from the word of God, so it is also possible for the individual soul to return to God through the word. The word is both an outward motion and a returning motion. Then all of Baba's cryptic, intriguing, almost abrasive statements on his silence appeared to fall into place. We are living in the flood tide age when God's whim to know his own divinity consciously has been given another great push within creation. Things are happening to man's inner being at a rate that could not be conceived of 20 years ago. Ours is the responsibility to look to this being who has given us once again this great forward push and by the reality of our devotion within his love to make the most of this new springtime of humanity. Not only is it a springtime because of the release of new vigor within creation and because of the freshness of the example of the Christ figure itself, but also it is also the end sorry, freshness of the example of the Christ figure itself, but because it is also the end of a cycle of, quote, destruction and suffering on a colossal sc scale, unquote. It is not only Mayor Baba, but it is he most clearly of all who tells us that all of creation is now moving on under the avatar, avataric touch into an age when not only the deserving, but the undeserving as well, will have their chance at divine grace. All one must do in the shower of spiritual rain that is now descending is to be alert to the opportunity that is about one. And the opportunity that is about one is starred and it says, message of cheer and hope to the suffering humanity from messages by Mayor Baba, Amanagar 1945. 
how magnificent it is to sense the slowly thinning pall of gloom and destruction and to sniff the moist fresh air that already gives hint of the rainbow in the heavens. D.E. Stevens, London, September 1970. The theme, there is no creature which is not destined for the supreme goal, as there is no river which is not winding its way towards the sea. But only in the human form is consciousness so developed that it is capable of expressing the perfection of its own true self, which is the self of all. However, even in the human form, the soul is prevented from realizing its birthright of joy and fulfillment because of the burden of sanskaras, which it has accumulated as a byproduct of its arduous development of consciousness. Like the dust that accumulates on the shoes of a traveler on foot, these sanskaras are gathered by the pilgrim as he treads the evolutionary path. In the human form, which is the crowning product of evolution, the divine life is enmeshed in the sanskaric deposits of the mind. The expression of the divine life is therefore curtailed and distorted by the distractions of the sanskaras, which weld consciousness instead to the fascinations of the false phenomenal. One by one, the many colored attachments to the false must be relinquished. Bit by bit, the sanskaric tinder feeding the deceptive flames of the separative ego must be replaced by the imperative evidence of the unquenchable flame of truth. Only in this manner can man ascend to the height of divine attainment, the endless beginning of life eternal. The life in eternity knows no bondage, decay, or sorrow. It is the everlasting and ever-renewing self-affirmation of conscious, illimitable divinity. My mission is to help you inherit this hidden treasure of the self. Mayor Baba. So going on to the Savas programs, that's part one. We already read part two and three, right, folks? Chapter one, Maribad. Old men, young men, middle-aged men greeted the silent master in the characteristic embrace reserved in the East for close friends. First, the new arrival would hang his head over the right shoulder of the great man to be patted or occasionally warmly thumped on the back. Then shoulders would be switched and the procedure repeated. Some leaned their cheeks on the great man's shoulder and held him gently in the small of the back with lightly pressed hands as a child reaches and clings to its mother. Others were left shoulder oriented rather than right shoulder oriented. And for a brief moment, confusion would ensue as greeter and greeted parried directions. But apparently heaven is not particularly partial to the right-handed over the left hand, for the master made no attempt to correct the situation and thumped just as heartily in the reverse order. Occasionally, some overflowing of feeling would cause one of the greeters to overstay, and imperceptibly, the warm-hearted thumping on the back would change to a good-humored prod in the ribs. The smile of bliss would change equally imperceptibly to a brief grin of embarrassment, and the shy guest would back away 
with covert glances to the side to see if he had been detected in his small indiscretion. The hall in which the greetings were taking place was one of a collection of buildings called Maribod. They lay on the edge of Arangaon, a small farming village several miles from Ahmednagar, which in turn had been an old fort post of the British army in bygone days of Eastern Empire. Ahmednagar lay in the Deccan, perhaps 200 miles by meandering human packed roads from Bombay. The present occasion was an event uncommon, even in a land renowned for avatars or Christs and saints and mystics. Here was a great master, perhaps more than that, greeting a picked group of his followers who were to spend one week of rare grace by living in close company with him as he discoursed, played, joked, exercised, and rested. A true Savas. And Savas is starred, and the asterisk explains, literally living in, a, in close companionship with the spiritual master. A true sabbath. This was not a common practice, and the Indian mind regarded it as a treasure to be dreamed of, but achieved only once in many lifetimes. These were the first early arrivals of a, a first group of 200. At the end of a week spent in the close company of the master, a second group of 200 was to arrive, and so on, until the four major language groups of Gujarati, Telugu, Hindi, and Marathi had been successively received for a week each. But even this early in the proceedings, Pendu, who supervised the physical arrangements for the Sava's proceedings, was muttering because Mayor Baba seemed unable to say no to a flood of entreating letters begging that the writers also be allowed to come. Already the first group was swelling beyond 200 souls and it seemed that the matter could not possibly be gotten under control until 300 at least had been allowed to come. Pendu's worries over the job of providing more steel sheets for shelter and more pulse for food and more matting for beds did not concern the rapt hundred already present. They showed only the widest of delighted smiles as each person moved with unconscious grace and simple dignity in a line formed down the center of the room. Although the group had been selected for its common language background, their dress defied all semblance of similarity. Some wore white cloth draped deep around one leg and high on the other. Others wore white pants, so full and sheer that they seemed to form a solid floor length skirt, while a few wore real full length skirts. European trousers were much in evidence and accenting the whole were the occasional robes of the priest and the wanderer. Many carried garlands of fresh flowers, which they hung about Mir Baba's neck. Others carried homemade candies or oranges or coconuts or even portraits of Baba. All of these gifts Baba smilingly accepted and passed on to one of the close disciples, Mondali. At his side, Mondali at his side. Sometimes an exclamation would break out by way of abrupt gesture 
as Baba spied an, occasion, an especially cherished friend. Often there would be a brief interlude of quick questioning as he inquired about health or welfare of some family member. Despite the apparent handicap of sub substituting fluid gesticulation for speech, Mayor Baba's silence of 30 years standing slowed the rate of his repartee not one whit. With only minor hesitations, Baba's gestures were caught and translated with uncanny ease by Eric, one of the devoted Mondali. And Mondali is starred there. Explanation, Mondali are close disciples who follow the instructions of the master implicitly. When no more than half the receiving line had been paired away, Baba became wearied with standing. Abruptly, he turned and walked back to a large chair set against the wall at one end of the room. Like a mobile centipede, the sinuous line of greeters followed immediately upon its prey and at once resumed its function of splitting off one segment after another in the ritual of salutation. Without warning, the even flow of feeling was interrupted at one point and all in the room focused their attention on the frowning Baba and the apprehensive, uneasily shifting individual before him. Do you have a cold? Erich translated Baba's gestures. Only a very small one, was the low-pitched reply. Do you have a sore throat? Baba queried further. A little. And your nose runs? Also a little. And while you are like this, you would embrace Baba and give him a cold tube. Baba persisted. And Baba persisted is daggered. And it says, see Appendix 2 for discussion of the susceptibility to disease of saints, sages, and the God realized. So... And while you are like this, you would embrace Baba and give him a cold too, Baba persisted. Oh no, Baba, came the horrified reply. And hesitantly, with jerky movements born of torn emotions, the individual backed away from his favored position at the head of the line. Suddenly, Baba's features softened and he gestured again. Perhaps tomorrow your cold will have improved and you can greet me with the remaining people who are yet to come. Once more, the line began to move, and soon the sense of running rivulets of feeling was everywhere again. The, the room filled with soft humming overtones, the muted cellos and the lowly vibrating basses of deep human emotion. From front to back and back to front, the rhythm changed and the key modulated by the moment in the fast moving drama of human feeling. Have you all read the instructions at the back of the room, Baba asked, when the last member had been greeted? And that, and that starred, see appendix one. <laughs> So have you all read the instructions at the back of the room, Bob asked, when the last member had been greeted? A majority nodded their heads in assent, but a few shook them in, in negation. Anyone who has not read the instructions should do so, Bob pursued. I want everyone to be sure to read them before I come tomorrow morning. Now I will leave you, and I will be here tomorrow morning at 8.30. If you find something which is not to your liking, be sure to let Baba know. <clears throat> I want you all to be happy. Do not worry about your families or your business. If you think of them, then you are with them and you are not with Baba. While you are here, enjoy yourself. 
Enjoy Baba. Forget your cares. He rose from his chair and strode out of the hall, a hurrying stream of hangers on, trying to keep pace with him as he walked rapidly to the waiting blue car. A few smiles and waves from the window and he was gone. Erich and several of the other Mondeli in the back seat. They would spend the night at Marizov, some miles on the north of Amadnagar. On the long, narrow verandas on either side of the hall, small knots of old and new friends exchanged pleasantries. In the hall itself, opposite Baba's ponderous armchair, a small, smaller cluster carried out the injunction to read the instruction sheets for the Sabas programs. programs. One man droned on in an in oddly accented English to his patient companion. I want you to read carefully and absorb these instructions. <clears throat> the sun sank below the far line of low hills and the cowherd children from Arangaon hard by began to drive their charges back across the poor open pasture and down along the railroad tracks towards the tiny po poverty ridden village. The combed clouds in the east took on soft oranges and then reds and shifted to violets and blues as the intense color of sunset ruby shifted to the mid heavens. <laughs> Slowly the color concentrated in the far horizon and at last day withdrew its cloak from the landscape of India, showing only the faintest glimpse of the red lining as it trailed across the far mountains. The land slept. Chapter two, the first day. At least half an hour before the appointed time on the following morning, the honk of the blue car could be heard approaching from the direction of Ahmednagar. Caught unawares, the Savasis rushed to perform last minute duties and to collect sundry garlands, presents, spectacle cases and other valuables. A frenzy of activity could be heard through the long line of doors of the outhouses. In a moment, these were bursting open like exploding popcorn and their occupants racing across the back lot to be at hand for the first sight of Baba. With a flourish, Mayor G's red fezzed driver brought the car to a halt before the great hall and a dozen eager hands reached out to open the front door of the car. Smiling broadly, Baba stepped out clad in spotless white from head to toe while the back seat unloosed its content of attentive mandalay. Holding someone's face momentarily between his hands here, banging his hand, some, someone, sorry, banging his hand warmly on a shoulder there, occasionally rearing back in surprise and grasping the arm of someone hand to elbow, Baba made his way slowly through the excited throng to the to the hall door. With a rapid scuffling and scraping, the motley group slid out of sandals and shoes and trod barefoot onto the closely carpeted stone floor of the hall. As if by instinct, they formed a line again before Baba's armchair. And the process of greeting the remainder of the group went on in high good humor. Close to Baba and on his left, at times almost crushed by the excited crowd, stood the indefatigable Erich. He was immaculately, immaculately turned out 
in blue-gray cotton suiting, which was buttoned high to his chin. A black Gandhi cap perched easily on his head and a fleck of, of gray in his clipped black mustache accent, accented his quick smile and rapid translation of Baba's gestures. Further towards the corner at Baba's left and already taking down hurried notes on the proceedings were two mondely of long standing and faithful service. In the opposite corner was Baba's secretary and manager of publications, while leaning against the wall and smiling in merry delight was still another close disciple who had also preserved silence now for many years. In the general babble and confusion, Dr. Dr. Deshmuk, dis distinguished professor and editor of Mayor Baba's discourses, slipped into the line of greeters. The action was curious as he had been among the first to be greeted the previous afternoon. Hard on his heels was Bal Natu, also apparently bent on a second try. When Deshmukh had come to the head of the line, Baba eyed him quizzically. Deshmukh, I already embraced you warmly yesterday. Yes, Baba, but I thought perhaps you would have forgotten and would greet me again today, was the unabashed reply. Erich almost exploded with laughter as he translated Baba's reluctant reply. All right, I will greet you this once more since it pains you so greatly to be any distance from me. Therewith, Baba drew Deshmukh over his right shoulder and then his left. As he fumbled with the elated scholar, Baba deftly, deftly swiped Deshmukh's prized fountain pen from his coat pocket. Waving it first to the side for all to see, he hid it in his own coat as he poked Deshmuk in the ribs as a warning that the second share of greetings was at an end. Both men drew back smiling in high good humor, each equally satisfied that he had outplayed the other. But it was now Balnatu's turn to try his hand at this astute game of poker. He knew before he had put one foot in front of the other that he was already topped. No, Bal Balnatu, not you too. That way I will have to embrace one and all again. As the crowd began to subside, it became clear that some of those still standing shyly in the background had never yet met Baba. One disciple of long standing came forward to handle the social amenities. Baba, these are faces which are new to you, but their devotion to you is not, he began, but Baba broke him off with a short gesture. How is it that your own voice sounds new today, he inquired. For a moment, the able man was overcome with confusion, unprepared as he was for the sudden switch in subject matter. Then a light of comprehension broke across his face and he smiled in recognition. Yes, Baba, since I saw you last, I have had some new dentures, which make me sound new also. But I am your old friend, so I will introduce my dentures to you. Thereupon he smiled broad broadly and turned slowly about so that D Baba and all might see these new friends. A medical practitioner from Hamirpur drew close. Baba greeted him by holding out his wrist. Feel my pulse and tell me how you find my health, he said. After carefully reading the pulse, the physician said, Baba, you are quite all right. In fact, you look wonderfully well. Several greetings later, Baba confronted a newcomer by drawing back in his seat and asking, how do you think Baba looks today? 
I must say, Baba, my friends and I were just remarking how terribly tired you look. You must not do so much. You must re rest more, was the frank reply. I get ill in five minutes and become all right within the next five minutes, Baba replied for all to hear. In five minutes, I grow old. And in five minutes, I am young again. What sort of a disposition do I have? None ventured to answer the question. One of the men, a young fellow with long black hair, full glossy beard, and a slender figure, belying the ferocity of the framing of his face, stepped forward to introduce a friend, Baba. This is one of my friends who has asked to come. He is not especially religious, but he wanted to come, he explained. I am not religious either, but that is because I am the only one in the whole of creation, was Baba's reply. Baba's reply is starred and the explanation is, similar statements are often made by Baba. The meaning is clear only if one will assume that it is possible for the individual soul to achieve union with God. In such case, the individual soul and God are one, and therefore the God realized being inevitably experiences himself as all of creation. So the greeting went and so it finally ended. Then Baba leaned back in his seat and looked thoughtful for a few minute moments. The audience cleared throats, settled into comfortable cross-legged positions, exchanged hurried last minute greetings with neighbors, and, and did all the uncount, unaccountable, small noisy things which must precede a public address. I hope you have all now read the instructions for the Sava's program, which are posted in five languages at the rear of the room, Baba stated. If you have not, then later this morning, be sure to read them. If you are unable to read them, have someone read them to you. Again, there was a moment's pause while Baba shifted in his seat, blinked his eyes as if they were smarting, and wiggled the fingers of his right hand in momentary abstraction. Another small flurry of coughs, sneezes, and whispers broke out from the audience. I have not asked you to come here for long discourses on philosophical subjects, Baba resumed his gestures as Erich translated. A proper savas means physical proximity, as well as mingling together, as do the members of one family. Uh, of one family, but my staying with you and your staying with me do not mean the same thing. For ages and ages, I have been with you, nearer to you than you feel yourself to be. Now you have an opportunity to be with me for a week, and also to come nearer and nearer to me for all time. During these seven days, I want you all to live with me as freely and intimately as the resident Mandali have done for years together. On my part, I will be equally free and frank with you in all respects, but do not anticipate hearing only pleasant things from me. As the elder in the family, I may find fault with you and scold you. During this precious week, try at least to forget everything else so that your hearts will remain clean and open for me to step in. Do not notice either your failings, weaknesses, and shortcomings, or your prestige, position, learning, and so-called knowledge of spiritual things. Try to forget what you think you already know. Let the atmosphere you have left behind remain there. You are now here physically. Try to remain here mentally as well. Follow me wherever I may be. 
Otherwise, though present here physically, you will remain mentally in your same old atmosphere. To have a passing thought and to keep thinking of it are two different things. If you fold your hands mechanically before me, but go on thinking of your problems at home, you will be folding your hands to them and not to me. Do not worry about thoughts. Never try to force your mind to check your thoughts. Thoughts may and will come. Do not try either to invite them or to drive them away. Let the thoughts come and go unasked by observing the most minute details about me and what I do and say, you will take little notice of your thoughts, good or bad. And good or bad is starred and the explanation is, to the student of Eastern thought, such instructions represent a necessary technique of removing the focus of attention from the self. Needless to say, the results produced are in direct relation to the caliber of the teacher and the honest wholeheartedness of the student who employs the technique. So, by observing the most minute details about me and what I do and say, you will take little notice of your thoughts, good or bad. Be careful of your health and keep fit. The moment you feel indisposed, do not hesitate to consult doctors Nilu and Kanak Dandi. Those who are used to homeopathic treatment should go to Padri. But for those who are suffering from the malady of love, I remain your, their doctor. At the first sign of a cold, get immediate treatment. Otherwise, all of you will catch cold and start a chorus of sneezing. With such powerful thought suggestion at work, the audience broke out into a chorus of self-conscious coughs and clearing of throats. Baba looked carefully and critically at his flock. The most important things, he resumed, which you have to forget for the time being, are the troubles in your day-to-day -day life at home, such as health, money, social matters, and other petty worries. Do not think that by coming here, your day-to-day -day difficulties will necessarily be solved, and do not expect my blessings for health or wealth. I hold no key to such problems. I am not a yogi, wali, or saint who can and does perform miracles. If you count upon such things from me in return for your savas with me, you may lose even what you now possess. I have not come amongst you for you to, to bow down to me, to perform my arti, Artie is sung in praise, to worship me. These things are good for the saints, wallies, and yogis. I expect much more from you. I have come to receive your love from you and to bestow my love on you. I have descended to your level for the one purpose of bestowing my love on you so that you may love God and become God. That was had a, has a dagger, not specifically directed towards this particular audience, but in the sense of God descending into human form for the benefit of all mankind. The very thorny subject of Baba's Christ avatarhood is treated at length in part three. So, I have descended to your level for the one purpose of bestowing my love on you so that you may love God and become God. The rest is all illusion. Do not expect anything from me except my love for you. Let us not hurry. Let us go slowly. You have fully five days here. 
five days here is starred. Each language group was officially assigned a week, but allowing time for arriving and settling down, and packing and leaving at the end of the sessions, plus a day for the workers to clean between groups, the actual time with Baba amounted to about five days for each group. Whether a point sounds small or big, be equally attentive. I may crack jokes, I may be serious. Listening to me will never be in vain. If you cannot grasp what I say, listen carefully regardless. Today or tomorrow, you will grasp everything that I say. Age after age, I have the, I ha I have the one same thing to tell. But each time I say it in a different manner and from a different viewpoint. Do not worry when you cannot follow what I say. Merely listening may possibly help someone to love me. Those who feel drowsy and are inclined to take a nap should move back towards the walls. Only those who feel alert should sit near me. And then thoughtfully, almost with a trace of sadness, People generally remain indifferent when I am present among them. They understand and appreciate me more after I drop my body. That is the way whenever I come. Whether moved by Baba's statement or by the need to relax muscles held too long in unused positions, several older men in front began to shift their positions with a self-conscious apologetic air. Baba noted this at once. Those who feel like strength straightening their legs should do so without any hesitation. We are here in each other's company. Remain at ease and do not become unnecessarily cramped through formality. Now we will have a game of seven tiles, he announced unexpectedly. And with a loud shout of enthusiasm, everyone poured out of the back door of the hall and onto the veranda. Baba quickly designated two teams of seven men each. A small heap of tiles was stacked in the middle of the floor and the two sides ranged at either end of the veranda with the spectators standing off on the ground at the side. In playing seven tiles, the in team pitches at the tiles, perhaps 15 feet away with a tennis ball. The out team tries to catch the ball before it, before it has touched the floor for a second time. To tumble the tiles is a score for the in team. To catch the ball before a second bound puts the pitcher out of the running. But when the out man returns the ball to the pitcher, if he fails to make the ball bounce before it is ca caught, all of the caught out pitchers are in the game again. This last point is the real sauce of the game, for there is an almost insuperable instinct among ball players to lob a ball direct to the waiting catchers rather than to bounce it to them. One of the teams had several frisky members from the universities in Pune and Bombay. One of these students with dark hair and a small black mustache and the devil in his eye had an uncanny ability to catch the opposing team's pitched balls before the second bounce. On the other hand, another member of this team with great craggy features and the build of a football tackle could pitch with a sizzle that almost defied catching. Between the two of them, and with not inconsiderable support from their teammates, they were licking the tar out of the opposition. The underdog team was up with two pitchers left and still without a hit in the entire game. 
one of their two remaining pitchers looked warily at the tiles and his grinning opposition. Wound up and let fly, he was caught cleanly and easily out by the devilish one. As the latter lazily tossed the bat ball back, a snowy arm reached out from nowhere and snatched it in midair. With a casual swing, Baba tossed the ball on to the startled pitcher. And with a wild cheer from the audience, all of the caught out pitchers rejoined the fray. The precedent having been established and mob response having sanctioned it, three times the arm reached out from a jabbering knot of spectators and saved the weaker team on the verge of catastrophe. But finally, Baba would save them no longer. It was Deshmukh's turn to pitch, and his ball was wide and slow. He was out. Deshmukh, for you, we have the we have the distance, Baba gestured, and moved Deshmukh halfway to the, to the pile of tiles. Deshmukh smiled in nervous embarrassment, pitched and missed by a wider margin than before. Again, Baba moved him a foot or two closer. Again, the tense Deshmukh pitched, and it seemed that certainly the tiles must have skipped out of the way. For again, they escaped at point blank range. A final time, Baba moved Deshmukh closer until he seemed more a bombardier sighting vertically on his target. Incredible, he missed again. Baba threw up his arms, walking off in sign that the game was done. As the group came back into the hall, a few late arrivals were waiting to greet Baba. One smiling Savasi came forward with a garland so large that he had difficulty unsorting himself from it. Baba chuckled as he saw the mass of confusion approaching him. What price did you pay for that great bulk of flowers? He asked. 10 rupees was the pro prompt reply at which a shout of laughter went up. Another approaching supplicant needed an entire basket to carry his tribute of flowers. As he struggled up to the chair, Baba remarked on his sallow complexion, you seem to be pulled down. Perhaps it is your love for me that makes your face look wan and withered. Then one who had traveled several times with Baba on his strenuous journeys contacting the musts or spiritually intoxicated approached to pay his respects. Are you happy, Baba asked? You look just the same as when I saw you last. The old friend nodded smilingly to acknowledge his health, the greeting and his appreciation of Baba's concern. Then he turned to go away. Wait, did you garland me? Baba asked as if there was some real doubt in his mind. No, Baba, I did not. You must also garland me, Baba signified by gestures as he removed one of the many strands of flowers from his neck and handed it to the waiting man. As the crowd settled on their haunches on the mat covered floor, Baba sat back in his seat momentarily. Then he focused his attention on the group and began to gesture as Erich translated. To garland me, to bow down to me and to sing my praises are comparatively the three most unimportant things. The three most important things on the path to God realization are love, obedience and surrender. There is no possibility of compromise about these three. So the asterisks we missed about the musks, see the wayfarers, William Duncan. Okay, back to Baba's words. Love is a gift from God. Obedience is a gift from master to man. And surrender is a gift from man to master. 
the one who loves, desires to do the will of the beloved, and seeks union with the beloved. Obedience performs the will of the beloved and seeks the pleasure of the beloved. Surrender resigns to the will of the beloved and seeks nothing. One who loves is the lover of the beloved. One who obeys is the beloved of the beloved. One who surrenders all, body, mind, and all else, has no existence other than that of the beloved, who alone exists in him. Therefore, greater than love is obedience, and greater than obedience is surrender. And yet, as words, all three can be sum summed up in one phrase, love divine. One can find volumes and volumes of prose and poetry about love, but there are very, very few persons who have found love and experienced it. No amount of reading listening and learning can ever tell you what love is. Regardless of how much I exp explain love to you, you will understand it less and less if you think you can grasp it through the intellect or imagination. Hafiz describes the bare truth about love when he says, Janam, Janabi Ishkra. Dargabasi balatar azakloast, kasayinastan busad ke jan der astin derai. Translation being, the majesty of love lies far beyond the reach of intellect. Only one who has his life up his sleeve dares kiss the threshold of love. The difference between love and intellect is something like that between night and day. They exist in relation to one another and yet as two different things. Love is real intelligence capable of realizing truth. Intellect is best suited to know all about duality, which is born of ignorance as it, and is entirely ignorance. When the sun rises, Night is transformed into day, just so when love manifests, not knowing or ignorance is turned into conscious knowing or knowledge. In spite of the difference between a keenly intelligent person and a very unintelligent person, each is equally capable of experiencing love, the quality which determines one's capacity for love is not one's wit or wisdom, but one's readiness to lay down life itself for the beloved and yet remain alive. One must, so to speak, slough off body, energy, mind, and all else and become dust under the feet of the beloved. This dust of a lover who cannot remain alive without God, just as an ordinary man cannot live without breath, is then transformed into the beloved. Thus man becomes God. At this point, at this, Baba stopped briefly and looking around, looked around at the intently listening audience. Then he plunged ahead more pointedly Listen to love without philosoph philosophizing about it. Listen to love without philosophizing about it. None present here loves me as I ought to be loved. If all of you had such love, none of you would be left before me. You would all have realized God and we would all have become the one which we all are in reality and in eternity. You accept me as being simultaneously God and man, the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. But by accepting me to be that, you do not know me to be that. To know me as I am, you must become conscious of my real state. And for that, you must love me 
as I love you. The Mondali who have been with me through thick and thin all these years are fully prepared for love of me, to lay down their very lives at such a sign from me. Yet even they do not love me as I love them. If they did, then they would have become one with my oneness, which in reality is the oneness of us all. It is love alone which can lift the veil between a lover and the beloved. Believe me, you and I remain divided by nothing but the veil of you, yourself. What does you, yourself, mean? When you feel hungry, you say, I am hungry. If unwell, you say, I am not well. When you say, Baba, I slept well, I am happy, my son died, they abused me, I feel miserable, those things are mine. It is this I, me and mine, which is the veil. It is only because of the veil of the false ego lying between us that you find yourselves involved in so many difficulties, troubles and worries, all of which disappear automatic, automatically when touched by the reality of love. When the curtain of your limited eye is lifted and it can only disappear through love, and love alone, you realize unity and find me as your real self, that is God. I say so because it is only I everywhere. There is really nothing like you. It requires cycles and cycles for one to be enlightened with real knowledge of self or God. Therefore, Millions upon millions of so-called births and deaths on your part are not sufficient in themselves to lift the veil of your limited eye. It can be removed through love, though, in infinitely less than a split second. <clears throat> All those who are true ascetics, yogis, wallies, peers, and saints are not necessarily God-realized. Only real lovers of God irrespective of sex, are the true mardan ikuda, that is, men of God. Even from among a hundred thousand such men of God, though, perhaps only one will become God-realized after many cycles. Both Hakim Sanai and Mulanar Rumi say the same thing in different words. Daor habayad Kayak Mard Sahib Dil Shawad and Saha Mardaan Burdan Intezer Tayakira Barshud Azad Azar. That is, it needs many cycles for just one advanced soul to be realized. When for many years man has longed for God realization. One out of a hundred thousand such men of God achieves it. No amount of rites, rituals, ceremonies, worship, meditation, penance, and remembrance can produce love in themselves. None of these are necessarily a sign of love. On the contrary, those who sigh deeply and weep and wail have yet to experience love. Love sets on fire the one who finds it. At the same time, it seals his lips so that no smoke comes out. Love is meant to be experienced and not disclosed. What is displayed is not love. Love is a secret which is meant to remain a secret, save for the one who receives it and keeps it. To love Baba in, in hopes of achieving health, wealth, betterment of family and friends, etc., is to love all these and not Baba. Such love cannot be compared with that of Adi and his wife Rhoda Dubash and Nariman and, and Navrozji Dadatanji and their family members. They can be justly proud of their love for me, which remained unshaken in the face of tragic accidents, which cost the lives of their dear ones, 
among my dear ones. As a matter of fact, Nozier Dada Chanji has come to me as all those do who remember me while breathing their last. Baba tells the story of Nozier later in the week. Love God and become God. I have come to receive your love and to give you mine. As I have already said, if you love me, you will find me. Unless you love me, you can never find me. Do not think that you can never love me or that you can find no time to love me. I often say that I want your love. I mean it because that is all that I want from you. Therefore, I always tell you to love me more and more. I have also said that you cannot love me as I ought to be loved. To do that, you must first receive the gift of my love. And that gift depends upon absolute pleasure on my part in giving you just a glimpse of the reality of myself. No one can possess love by any means other than as a gift. But I give love to self and accept it myself. The giving of love knows no law save love, which by itself is the law which governs all other laws of nature. It is always infinitely easy for me to give, but it is not always equally easy for you to receive the gift of my love. Baba paused once again and his eyes moved over the face turned patiently, quietly, even sadly towards him. Not one visage in the room indicated that the thinking, feeling, aspiring man behind it interpreted the master's words in any manner other than he intended them. That the great goal of each being, human being is the realization of his own oneness with God and that there can be no greater, no more necessary boon in achieving this goal than the love and the grace of the perfect being who is already one with God. Sometimes it is also infinitely impossible for one to receive that love. Erich interpreted Baba's wide sweeping gestures as he continued his intense preoccupation with the subject. That is why Kabir says that some ask for it and do not get it. Some get it unasked, and yet there are those who are unable to receive it, even when it is offered to them. I am ever prepared to give the gift, but you must also prepare yourself to receive it. That requires real daring. Even in ordinary animal and human life, there are upper reaches in which a mother is sometimes negligent of her own life for the sake of her offspring. Or a man can remain without sleep or food or thoughts of lust for days due to his restlessness, restlessness born of true love for a woman. Divine love is the fire which not only eliminates all kinds of cold, but also all sorts of imagined heat. For example, among the very, very few who possess such love is the must, known as Dondiba at Kolar, Kolalpur, Kolapur. Though exposed to the rigors of heat, cold, and rain through all the seasons, his body remains healthy well-fleshed and strong, the fire is burning within him, unknown even to those in his surroundings. His mind has no link with his body. Love pervades him from head to foot. Although love is beyond intellect, there are innumerable points about it which can still be explained by reason and brought within its grasp. But in finality, I remain, everything else is zero, and I am the only reality. That reality cannot be reached in illusion through illusions. 
and there can be no hide and seek about love. When God becomes man, avatar, Buddha, Christ, Rasul, he can bestow both love and obedience upon and accept the surrenderance of any and all individuals. I say all this as much to those who have been living with or for me all these years as to those who are only with me now for this Sabbath. I tell you honestly that if you obey me honestly, you will become me, your own real self. This is not the first time I have said this. For ages past, I have been telling all to leave everything and to follow me. That means to obey me so that you may have conscious experience of me. Now is the time when those who obey me will realize me. Obedience, which is greater than love, is the 100% obedience described by Hafiz. Mazan chuno chara, dum ke banda i mukpio, bajan kubul kunad, her sukan ke sultan guft. Broadly speaking, this means carry out every command of the master without question, as is becoming to a lucky slave. About 30 years ago, before I started observing my silence and when Meribad was a colony of hundreds of seekers, uh, I guess I should read these, the asterisks. Must is a spiritually preoccupied and divinely intoxicated person. And the dagger says, not in the sense of Meher Baba as a person, but as one who is one with God. Baba's constant theme is that all men are really one with God and therefore inevitably one with all God realized beings and with each other as well, if they only knew it. So about 30 years ago, before I started observing my silence and when Maribad was a colony of hundreds of seekers, servers and sufferers who lived in the ashrams or abodes, asylums, shelters, schools, dispensaries, and the hospital, here at that time, a visitor came to surrender to me. He could not help weeping when I told him that what he intended was very, very difficult, since surrenderance means obedience, and obedience has but one meaning, and that is to obey. He said he knew that and was prepared to obey me implicitly. When I inquired if he would cut his own child to pieces if I asked him to do so, he even agreed to that. But when I asked him to remove his clothes and walk about naked in the streets of Ahmednagar, he began to protest and ultimately went his way. I am not going to ask you to do that, Baba hastened to tell the audience. I never expect anyone to do the impossible. Chuckles of understanding greeted this comment. A reshuffling of cramped limbs took place as a small buzz of background conversation vented the feeling of a number of individuals to their neighbors that there was not much purpose in seeking a great master if the aspirant could not face even such a first test as this. Baba's smile faded and he began to look serious again. Now that you are in my sabas, you should know all about my habits and about my behavior to the Mandali who live with me. I love Kaiko Bad, one of the resident Mandali, and often bow down to him. Whenever I go out on mas must tours or for other congregations, I ask Kaiko Bad to lay his hand on my head and bless me. Recently at Satara, he wept and protested, but I told him to continue to obey me to the point of kicking me, should I ask him to do so. Kaiko Bad has been with me for 12 years. He has his family. They are staying on Maribad Hill. Maribad Hill is starred, a separate group of buildings about one half mile 
from the collection in which the Sava's programs were being held. During this time, they were occupied, in addition to the staff by Francis Brabazon, the distinguished Australian poet, and the narrator, who were the only Occidentals present at the Sava's programs. So um, he, that's Kaikobad, has dedicated everything to me and I have accepted him. He belongs to, to the Parsi or Zoroastrian priest class. And hence he is also called Dastur, which means a priest. And he is a real priest. He sees Baba as Baba is to be seen. And he takes Baba's blessing as blessings are to be taken. He has also been silently repeating Baba's name 100,000 times every 24 hours all these years. He had the first glimpse of divinity at Meribod in 1946. Again, on August 31st, 1953, he experienced at Dera Dune such bliss that he was on the point of dropping his body. Now he says he can see glimpses of my reality whenever he wishes. At such moments, he sees even in a he sees even a dark room lit up with such brilliance that compared with it, the brilliance of the sun is nothing. Then in that light, he sees me. That is no miracle performed by me. I cannot do that myself. I know only one thing that I am everywhere and in everything. Despite all that, Kaikobad has yet to realize God. He is on the path and he has to go on and on. He often tells me that he's enjoying my grace and I always tell him, and I mean it, that it is his love for me that gives him the wonderful experiences of the path. Even though glimpses, his experiences give him deep bliss and the unshakable conviction that I am his master. Therefore, he will carry out any of my orders promptly and cheerfully. Kaikobad, Baba gestured as he looked towards the back of the audience, stand up. A slim, gentle-faced man stood up about two-thirds of the way back in the hall. Is not what, what I have said true? Baba queried. Yes, Baba, everything you have said is exactly true, Kaikobad replied and looking for a moment at Baba to see if anything further was demanded of him, he sat down again. Whatever I say, Baba resumed, I say it in all sincerity, unquestioning obedience to me without consciously knowing me will bring you nearest to me, but it is impossible to obey me, obey me literally and spontaneously. If I were you, if I were in your place, I myself would not be able to do that. The best thing for you would be to obey me cheerfully. In any case though, to obey me now when you have not yet consciously experienced my greatness is in itself a great thing. Much of the value of obedience is lost once conviction is transformed into actual conscious knowledge of my reality. That is the purpose for which you have been called. So we'll stop here at the top of page 24.